Now let, let's look at verses 24 through 26 for the rest of our episode. Zero in on the bridegroom of blood stuff. I'm going to read the verses again. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Z- Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin. Okay. Cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, I have, back in 2011, so this is seven years ago, I had blogged about this. Uh, I had mentioned that in the last time. Um, what I'm going to give you here, again, I, I think is, is just worded better than what was back on the blog. So I've, I've actually, I've actually um, you know, swapped some of this discussion in. You know, I, I, I more or less wanted to write this out for the sake of the blog because there were some things in, in there that I thought were just not, not clear, not sufficiently clear. So I've, I've tried to dress that up a little bit. So I'm telling you that here on the podcast. But, you know, what we're going to hear now, again, is essentially, you know, you, you, you could have read it before already, you know, on the blog. But I think, I think the, you know, the wording is better here. I, I just took a little more time to, you know, for the sake of clarity, to try to dress things up. The issues are, again, as we look at verses 24 through 26, what are the things we need to think about? Well, there's what in the world is up with placing the foreskin at Moses' feet. It's kind of odd that God would want to kill Moses, especially on the heels of calling him and then making a concession for him with the Aaron, Aaronic priesthood, and then reminding him of, that you need to go to Egypt while he's in Midian. Again, it, you know, it would have to be something that's pretty, pretty significant you know, for Moses as the person God wants to lead his people, for God to just get this angry and, and consider killing him. The other issue is that, as we're going to see, there are certain ambiguities in these three verses in the text, specifically what certain verbs refer to and who the actors are precisely in the scene. Because I can tell you right now, the ESV has made, and every translation does this, this isn't a slap on the ESV. The ESV translator has inserted names and nouns in places in verses 24 through 26, where in the Hebrew text, there are only pronouns, he and his and him. Okay, the, the translator has done that to try to make the, the content of these verses comprehensible. But we need to talk about that because knowing that certain things are ambiguous in the Hebrew text, like what does the pronoun refer to when it says his or him? Is it is it Moses' son or Moses? Again, which which they're both masculine. So wh- which one does the masculine pronoun refer to? You have you have to make a you have to make an educated or an interpretive guess. You have to you have to you have to land somewhere in interpretation, and the, and the translation, of course, is going to land somewhere to try to you know try to steer us through. But you know sometimes the choices that translators make are good. Sometimes they're not so good. Sometimes they help. Sometimes they muddy the waters even more. But we need to think about all of these things. So let, let's try to approach the stuff we need to think about. Uh, really, I guess, two trajectories here. So first, who is it that the Lord wanted to kill? Now, now you would think, and, and we've sort of presumed here in, in, in the sake of our discussion, you would think that that's Moses. And most readers would assume it is Moses since he's mentioned in the preceding verses. But verse 24 actually doesn't name him. You know, we, we see here, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. We don't get the Lord met Moses. We get the Lord met him. And you say, well, why is that an issue? Well, uh, Moses is traveling with two boys, his, his two sons. Could it be that Moses or God wanted to put one of them to death? Would that make more sense? Because he just called Moses. Why does he want to kill him off now? I mean, you actually have you know, this, this discussion going on. And since it's one of the boys' foreskins that is, is removed through circumcision, in other words, since the solution of the, of, of the episode is the circumcision of one of the boys, maybe it's one of the boys that God wants to kill because he's uncircumcised. Okay? So, you know, who, who exactly are we talking about? Who's under threat? The other, again, trajectory is what does it mean 
for Zipporah to touch Moses' feet with the foreskin. Now, there are two other factors, again, that, that are going to be part of this discussion as we try to take things in order. Again, we Zipporah knows what to do. She's familiar with circumcision, obviously. She knows that it should be done, and she knows how to do it. She knows how it's done. So that is going to become a factor in, in interpretation as well. So we've got ambiguities in there. We've got some things we can assume about Zipporah, who is a Midianite woman. Again, and think of the Kenites. The, the Kenites should be familiar with the worship of Yahweh. And part of the worship of Yahweh, whether they're, they're the, you know, the quote-unquote you know, forgotten or lesser line, the non-elect line from Abraham, they still know about circumcision. Okay, so there's something going on there. Zipporah knows it's important. She knows what to do. She knows how to solve the problem. She knows what the problem is, and she takes care of business. And the way she takes care of business is circumcising her son. So we've got that much. Is the son the one under the threat? What about this touch in the feet thing? Again, that, that's what we've, you know, as we proceed, those are the things, the questions we need to answer. So let's take things in order. With whom was God angry and why? Now, I would say it seems best to conclude that God is angry with Moses and not his son, Gershom. Since Moses is the major character in the wider context, and Gershom is known only from Exodus 2, 22 at this point, he, he, he has nothing to do with the story. And so despite the fact that it's the circumcision of the child that fixes the problem, or is it? Okay, or is it? Is it just, is, is God's anger pacified just by circumcising the boy, or is more needed? Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to that point. But if there's more needed, then it's not, you know, we can't necessarily con conclude that just because the boy is circumcised that he's the problem. So I, I, again, I think that Moses is the one under threat here. That just makes more sense. Scholars have noted that Moses is the center of Yahweh's attention everywhere else in the story, even in the digressions about Aaron. You know, it's, it's still really about Moses and how to, how to deal with his resistance, his unbelief, his uncertainty, you know, his, you know, really, in, in some, I think you could call it rebellion in, in some sense as well. So that much seems clear. I mean, it's a better option. But of course, that, the, the question of why God is angry with him is still on the table. So I would say the the answer to that question has to be inferred from two considerations. One, the Israelites born in Egypt had been circumcised, okay, although this might still be a problem. They were circumcised, you know, according to what God had passed on or told Abraham to do. We, we know from Joshua 5, verses 2 through 9, I'm just going to read you that, that section because it's going to become relevant here. We read, again, this is Joshua. This is about, you know, they're, they're getting ready to go into the, into the promised land. So it's much later. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. A second? How can you be circumcised a second time? That's interesting, isn't it? So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeat ha Aralot. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out, came out of Egypt, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Okay, so you've got kids, you know, growing up, and, and apparently you could say, well, well, okay, they weren't circumcised yet. Why the second time? Verse 5, though all the people who came out of Egypt, Okay, so verse 4 is about the, the, the kids that were born during the wilderness wanderings and all that. They need to be circumcised, okay, the, the, male, the boys, the men. But verse 5 harkens back to the previous generation. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. So verse 5, the first part of it says, the people who came out, you know, had come out of Egypt, they had been circumcised. So they're doing circumcision in Egypt, okay, or, you know, they're, they're before this point. It's the ones afterwards that have not. But then what, what in the world is the second time thing going on? It's just really odd. Verse 7, so it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, for they were un uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. 
So verse 8, they circumcised the whole nation. When that was finished, they remained in their places in the camp till they were healed. And then, of course, you know, the conquest is going to start. So, you know, what's up with this? How does it inform the issue with Moses? Why is God angry at him? And again, this has to be inferred from two considerations. The Israelites born in Egypt had been circumcised, apparently according to you know, the, the covenant with Abraham. That's why they were doing it. And two, we have to consider the circumstances of Moses' birth and childhood again. Now, let's just jump in. With respect to the, the, the first of these items, it may be that the Israelites in Egypt practiced Egyptian circumcision. Okay, Israelites are in Egypt. What we just read in Joshua says they were they were circumcising down in Egypt. Maybe this Joshua doing the circumcision a second time, maybe this refers to the fact that, or to the possibility that, the circumcision they were doing in Egypt was not correct. Egyptian circumcision, which by the way refers to a method not anything religious, like, like circumcision wasn't being done in honor to some foreign god, okay? Egyptian circumcision refers to a method, and it's possible Moses and other Israelite men were not properly circumcised. The second time in Joshua 5.2 might be an indication of this, that, yep, they were, but we got to do it again because it wasn't done right. Having fled from Egypt, God may have expected Moses to correct this before returning to Egypt. You know, because Moses is the representative now of Israel. He is the leader of Israel, whether he wants to be or not, he is. I mean, Aaron's going to again take up the slack, obviously. But Moses is the key figure here, and God might be angry with him because he has been circumcised incorrectly and never took care of the problem. Now, that's an argument from silence, but any other explanation is as well. You know, so this is what we're dealing with here. Let me let me just rabbit trail a little bit about the circumcision thing in Egypt. Archaeologists and Egyptologists know that circumcision was practiced in Egypt by the Egyptians. However, Egyptian circumcision did not remove the foreskin. That's how it's possible you could be circumcised again, all right, if it wasn't done properly. Egyptian circumcision did not remove the foreskin. Rather, the foreskin was just split. It was left there, but it was split. For this reason, any Israelite born in Egypt who happened to be circumcised in this way had not been circumcised in a manner acceptable to God's covenant. Now, those who take this trajectory as an explanation for God's anger would suggest that Egyptian circumcision is what's hinted at in Joshua 5, 2, again about the second time, but also Joshua 5, 9, which reads, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach from Egypt from you. Now, uh, yeah, the reproach from Egypt might be their bondage and slavery because they're going to go into the land now and have their own land. I, I get that. But there are some who, who say that the issue with circumcising them the second time is correcting this Egyptian method. And maybe that is the reproach of Egypt. We're, we're fixing that problem now by having everybody, both the, the, the men who came out of Egypt that are still around, and then the second generation that was born on the way in the wilderness wanderings, they're both circumcised properly now, both groups. So maybe that's what the reproach of Egypt refers to. Again, it, it's, it's possible. So again, given this set of circumstances, the ceremony in Joshua 5 would be a second circumcision for some and a first second circumcision for the males born in the wilderness wanderings. Again, Joshua 5.2 is really what this view hangs on, this reference to the second time. So that's, again, that, that's one way to look at this. Since other Israelite males were circumcised prior to the conquest, again, prior to Joshua you know, 5.2.9 at Gilgal, and some a second time, it is reasonable to assume, again, since they had to do this, since they had to fix this, first generation and second generation, it's reasonable to assume that Moses had never been circumcised, or that he was circumcised according to Egyptian custom. The narrative of Moses' birth and childhood never states that his parents, like his, his Israelite parents, had him circumcised. Had the boy been marked by Hebrew circumcision, maybe his life would have been in danger in Pharaoh's household. Who knows? We can only speculate whether Pharaoh's daughter had him circumcised in the Egyptian manner after he entered her household. In, in either scenario, 
whether Pharaoh's daughter had this done according to the Egyptian custom or whether his parent, his Israelite parents just didn't do it. Again, thinking that, well, when the baby's discovered, you know, if they, if they see it's an Israelite male, they might kill him because that's what Pharaoh ordered. Okay. Either scenario means that Moses did not bear the covenant sign. And that is why God is angry. Now, in his Exodus commentary, this is in the Word Biblical Commentary series, Durham notes this material. This is his discussion over, over all this. So, you know, it's not just Mike here, okay? Durham is going to refer to, he's going to cite an article by Jack Sasson. It's S-A-S-S-O-N. So here we go. The, the quote is this. Sasson has pointed out convincingly that Egyptian circumcision was not only performed on adults, but was, by comparison with Hebrew circumcision, merely a partial circumcision. Indeed, he contends that circumcision may well have come to Egypt from North Syria, where it was practiced early in the third millennium B.C., for whatever reasons, the compiler who set verses 24 through 26 in their present context had apparently reached a conclusion confirmed by these facts. Perhaps he combined the abnormal circumstances by which the infant Moses had been hidden away at birth with some knowledge of the Egyptian practice and even a belief that the circumcision of infant boys was a late development in Israel's life. Quite possibly, he too was searching for some reason for Yahweh's serious encounter. Whatever the case, he clearly believed that Moses was uncircumcised and that Yahweh determined to stop him and route to Egypt for that reason. That's the end of the Durham quote. So again, this isn't Mike just sort of speculating. I mean, this is this is a this is an explanation for why God is angry that other scholars, you know, have come up with and again just trying to overview the basis for it. Another angle, again, with this, let's just go back to Moses' childhood here. Another angle is that it's possible Moses' mother would not have had him circumcised again because of the edict. I want to say a little bit more about that. You know, again, the rationale in that case would have been that, you know, maybe the Egyptian, an Egyptian who discovers the boy will see him uncircumcised and have mercy on him or something like that. But see, there's a problem with that. Pharaoh's daughter knew immediately that the baby was a Hebrew. You know, so the question is, how did, how did she know? Now, it doesn't have to be because he was circumcised. It could be something as simple as, well, why would anybody else put their kid in a basket and set him afloat in the Nile? It's got to be a Hebrew kid. You know, in the movie, it has him with a Hebrew blanket or something. You know, just <laughs> the Ten Commandments movie doesn't get into all this stuff. So it doesn't have to, you know, the, the, the fact that Pharaoh's daughter recognizes this is a Hebrew boy doesn't, doesn't mean that the Hebrew boy was circumcised. He, circumcised. he may not have been. Even if he was, again, there, there's no sense in, in avoiding the circumcision, you know, you, you would think, because, you know, she's trusting God or whatever. I think the chances are really good. I think that, you know, if, if, if the Israelite parents of Moses had had him circumcised, then there's no need for, you know, the, the, the secondary Egyptian circumcision, which, which again, did not remove the foreskin. So I, I think I think the best bet here is, again, it's, it's all a guess. This is all speculation. I think the best bet is that Moses arrived in Pharaoh's household uncircumcised. Pharaoh's daughter had him circumcised according to the Egyptian custom, which was a partial circumcision. And that was never corrected when Moses fled Egypt and went into, into Midian. And he's not thinking about Yahweh at all. He's thinking about, I got to get out of Egypt and basically stay alive and have a nice home here. But God calls him at the burning bush incident. And again, we're not told, they don't have a conversation about circumcision, but it, it, apparently God is thinking, do the math, Moses. You're in Midian. They worship Yahweh here. I'm Yahweh. I'm calling you to go to Egypt. You know, you might want to bear the sign of the covenant people if you're leading the covenant people. But apparently that either, either that doesn't occur to Moses or he said, oh, you know, I don't, uh, well, that's going to hurt. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> entirely consistent with Moses' character here. That's going to hurt. And I don't want to go anyway. You know, and so he, you know, he goes back to Midian. He doesn't talk to Jethro right away. God has to remind him, you know, you're supposed to go to Egypt. Okay. You know, and God even, look, everybody who, who wanted you dead is dead now. You know, you know, let's get the show on the road here. And, 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 and Moses does. He moves. You know, they go on their way and they stop at Sinai. They meet, you know, they're, they're going to do all that. But when he leaves Midian 
and this is my view. When he leaves Midian and he's on the way to Sinai, this is before they've met Aaron, God gets angry because he has not taken care of the covenant sign of proper circumcision. Okay, this is how I would reconstruct things here. I, I think I think this is probably the, the best sort of scenario that we can we can garner and put together, again, using some inference, uh, using our imagination a little bit to it to infer some some things about why God would have been angry and, and how the itinerary works. Now, the reason why I think this event happens before they meet Aaron is because Aaron is a priest. He's a Levite. He would know what to do. I mean, if, if, if it became clear that God's going to kill Moses unless we do the circumcision thing or whatever, you know, um, he would know what to do. And so Zipporah would not have to perform the circumcision of her boy. Aaron would have done that. Again, now, this is all guesswork. It's an argument from silence. But I think, again, you can put the things together by making those inferences. So, again, th this is my view of, of how things are, are, are going on, you know, I, I, what, what the scenario is. Now, you could ask, well, why didn't she just circumcise her husband Moses and then they, you know, wait a few weeks or whatever? You know, Moses is probably a crybaby about that, like he's a crybaby about everything. So, you know, it, it might take a week or two or whatever, or, or maybe Moses would use it as, as an excuse to delay the trip even further. And I think that's the key. I think the reason why it was sufficient for Zipporah to circumcise the child and then touch Moses' feet, and we'll get to what feet are, with the foreskin of her son, sort of a circumcision by proxy, I think that's probably what's going on, that it's a symbolic gesture or something like that, to to have God's anger against Moses pacified. So let's just jump into into the into the rest of it. So I think that is what's actually going on, and and I think because she does it, they're not in Aaron's presence yet. Again, I'm I'm fully admitting that I'm just using inferences here, and again trying to piece together things from the data that aren't specifically said. But everybody has to do that. So we're at the point of asking the question, who was circumcised and what did it mean? Now, regardless of the fact that we don't know how to precisely take all this stuff because it's never spelled out, you, you got a couple options here. Either, either Moses was properly circumcised and he neglected to have his son circumcised, in which case God would, could be, in, in theory, mad at either one of them. But if that's the case, when they circumcise the kid, why, is, why doesn't it end there? Why doesn't it stop there? Why do you have to touch Moses' quote-unquote feet to make things good with God? So again, I think the real problem is Moses. Again, that his, his inadequate circumcision. And it's not just the boy. And I think that they don't circumcise Moses there because that's going to delay the trip even longer. And God wants him in Egypt. I mean, the the, the the one thing you do that does come through clearly if you read chapter four is God wants him in Egypt, like now. You know, we're not going to put this off anymore. I've I've told Aaron to meet you. Let's go. Go, 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 go. Okay, get out of here. So I think that again is part of the rationale. Now the Midianites, again, as you think back to the Kenite episode, as worshipers of Yahweh, they're going to know about circumcision, they're going to know about Abraham, they're going to know about the covenant. They know about the necessary tool, you know, the flint, you know, uh, knife there to to do the right. Again, they, they know what's going on here. So this is how I would handle what you know, the rest of, of our little weird, you know, sidebar here, verses 24 through 26. Again, concerning whether Moses or his son Gershom was circumcised, clarity can be gained in Zipporah's act of touching the foreskin to the feet of Moses. And I think Moses is the issue. Let's talk about the feet before moving on. The Hebrew word for feet, regal, can refer to feet, legs, or genitals, according to Old Testament usage. This was a, a euphemism. Uh, it, it was a word that was used, again, as, as sort of a nice way, you know, to refer to the genital area. You know, we, you know, every language, every culture, you know, has this sort of thing. Uh, euphemistic language for private parts or sexual acts or something like that. Okay, this this is what we're dealing with. For example, in Deuteronomy twenty eight fifty seven, we read, "Her afterbirth." This is again part of law. Her afterbirth that comes out from between her feet, and her children, whom she bears, so on and so forth. Well, 
the afterbirth doesn't really come out between your feet. I mean, you can, well, yeah, you know, the, the legs are apart. And, you know, I, I was there at the birth of my kid and the afterbirth, you know, the feet were there too. Look, the, the whole point is that it comes, the afterbirth comes out of the genital area. Okay, of a woman. Go to Ezekiel 16, 25. I think it's even clearer. This is the, really the somewhat pornographic passage that we covered back in our series on Ezekiel, where it, the, the language is really graphic. Sexual language is really graphic there. And we have this verse in, in uh, I'm going I'm to just go out to this one and get it, pick up a little bit, maybe the verse before. I'll, I'll start in verse 23. So Israel is being, or Judah is being compared to a whore, okay, a prostitute prostituting herself with other nations, other gods, committing spiritual adultery, all this kind of stuff. Adultery and sexual whoredom were, were used as metaphors for spiritual unfaithfulness. So we read in verse 23, after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a vaulted chamber, built yourself a bedroom there, you know, set up a bed, and made yourself a lofty place in every square. You know, you're, you're, you're looking for clients at every, every street corner. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoredom, or your whoring. Now, ESV's offering yourself is literally in the Hebrew, spreading your regal, spreading your feet. Again, it's exposing your, your genitals, spreading your legs, okay? I mean, that... that we get the idea. You, you're, you're not, you know, a, a, the woman in Ezekiel 16 who does this doesn't want some man to come by and touch her feet, like her real feet with toes, okay? That's not what's going on there. This is euphemistic language, again, for the sexual, you know, genital area. You get the same thing with Ruth 3 and 4. Again, uh, Ruth, Naomi tells Ruth, you know, when Boaz lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. This is when when Ruth wants to, and she gets the message across pretty well. She uncovers his genital area. I mean, they're wearing these long skirt things. She just flips it open. They don't have underwear, folks, in the Bible days, okay? That'll probably become a meme now. Um, they don't have underwear. So she exposes him. Why does she expose him? Why does Ruth do this to Boaz? It's a marriage proposal. I want you to marry me. I want to have your children. You need to, you need to redeem me. You know, you're, you're, we're related. It's the law of the kinsman redeemer. You know, she wants him to take her in, you know, and become his wife. And then we get the whole thing about, well, there's somebody that's in line ahead of me and you know, got to take care of that kinsman thing according to the laws of Deuteronomy, blah, 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 blah. I mean, there's nothing sexual, you know, as far as intercourse that happens in the Ruth scene, because that would have been a violation of the kinsman law. And Boaz doesn't do that. They go through the legal procedure before he can marry her. But she makes her intent, her wish, very obvious. She exposes him and then lays down. And it's like, okay, message understood. <laughs> because they have the conversation uh, about what to do next. But again, the, the whole point is here, the reference to the feet is the genital area. Now, Durham, again, notes this. This isn't just Mike, you know, going to crazy town here. This is, this is common, you know, Old Testament scholarship. This is nothing new. You'd, you'd find this in, in serious commentaries uh, written by various people. Again, Durham thinks this makes good, again, contextual sense uh, as far as Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26, when, put it this way, the act of touching the foreskin of Moses' son. Okay, Zipporah performs the circumcision, takes the foreskin, and touches Moses' feet. The act of touching the foreskin to the feet, i.e., Moses' own genital area, the touching part is not part of normal circumcision. You don't read that as part of a, a procedure for circumcision, so there's some special circumstance. And of course, the circumstance is that Moses' own circumcision is not adequate. He has to be approved, he has to be sort of looped into the covenant relationship by proxy. He has to have this taken care of, like now, and then get to Egypt, like now. So it consequently only makes sense if Zipporah has circumcised her son, Gershom, and then symbolically transferred the circumcision to Moses by taking the foreskin and touching Moses' genitals with it. Under the circumstances, Moses would have been incapacitated, had they done this to him, 
and they circumcised him. And they were already on the way to Egypt. So apparently, if you read again through verse 26, God was satisfied by the ritual act, and Zipporah had saved her husband's life. I mean, that, that's what's going on here. In regard to the phrase bridegroom of blood, the phrase is obviously associated with the marital relationship. Okay, the word bridegroom there. So why use the term and what's the bridegroom of blood? I mean, what's the significance of the phrase? Moses' status as a bridegroom must, of course, have some importance here. And Durham, I'll just read from Durham here. Durham says, Zipporah, the only person available to perform the rite, and again, I agree with that because I don't think they've met Aaron yet, seizes the mandatory flint cutting tool and circumcises not Moses, who would have been temporarily incapacitated by the surgery, at a crucial time when he could no longer delay his journey. So she, sac he, she circumcises her son. For the child, who was not to make the journey to Egypt in any case, the effects of the circumcision would be less problematic. To transfer the effect of the rite, Zipporah touched the severed foreskin of her son to the genitals of Moses, intoning as she did so the ancient formula, recalling circumcision as a premarital rite. For a bridegroom of blood you are to me. This ancient phrase, as Mitchell has demonstrated, it was a phrase of marital relationship. Now, in other words, let me try to decipher some of that. Circumcision was a premarital ritual obviously performed on a male infant, you know, well before the, the, the boy is going to get married. As the sign of the covenant, circumcision identified men as Israelite for the sake of Israelite women, because they were only supposed to marry fellow Israelites. So it, when, when you got your, your, you know, your man, or your, it's your honeymoon night, okay, the fact that he's circumcised is important because then you know you're marrying within the covenant bounds. This is why circumcision is one of its meanings is, again, has to do with, with marriage, you know, you're, that the marriage is legit. Okay? It's within, again, the Israelite community. So it ensured that the married couple were both Israelites and there was no forbidden intermarriage taking place. We have to assume that Zipporah had learned and embraced the idea that the God of the mountain, she knew by virtue of her proximity to it in Midian anyway, you know, I mean, they had heard of Yahweh and they knew where the mountain was. It's not next door, but they know where it is. That this was the God of the Israelites, okay, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, or and, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he was the true God. So Zipporah apparently knows that, believes it. This is particularly coherent if the Kenite connection involves the worship of Yahweh, which again, we talked about at length. Zipporah's marriage to Moses linked her to the Israelite people. Okay, she's marrying Moses now, and their covenant relationship to Yahweh. Under normal circumstances, her husband would have been a circumcised Israelite man, but that apparently isn't what's going on here between the two of them. This ritual of circumcision by proxy made Moses her bridegroom of blood. It legitimized him as an Israelite man that she could marry and be secure in marrying within a covenant relationship with Yahweh. And so part of the ritual act of touching the foreskin to of Gershom to Moses' general area atoned for this oversight. And again, Zipporah saves Moses. 